Hi there, good evening, uh, and welcome to the 35th uh, uh, edition or episode, or however you want to call it, of Octoprint on Air. I'm your host, Gina Heuske, and apologies in advance for me probably doing this, what I just did throughout the whole thing. I My throat is somehow a bit weird today. Um, yeah, so uh, as usual, I will be talking to you uh, today about what I've been up to the past couple of weeks ever since the last installment of these uh, broadcasts, uh, what the next steps will be. Then we'll have a very brief look at the um, uh, yeah at the at the statistics from the anonymous usage tr uh, tracking plugin that's bundled with Octoprint, and then we have a short uh, Q and A segment with I think three questions that were sent in beforehand. And if there's still time, then we'll also take a look at if there are any questions from the live chat. But yeah, we'll have to see uh, where we land uh, time wise. Um, as always, for those of you watching this live, um, so right now, <laughs> um, the, there is a live chat over there um, uh, on desktop. Or is it over there? No, it should be over there, I think. And uh, there is also one uh, below if you are watching this on mobile. And uh, yeah, I will keep an eye on that. Uh, if you see me looking over there, that's where I have the window. And then, uh, yeah, if anything comes up and there's time to uh, get back to it, then I will make sure to do so. Okay, so uh, let's get this started properly, I guess. Uh, what I've been up to. So uh, the past couple of weeks, I've primarily concentrated on working, uh, uh, yeah, on, on working on what is going to be Octoprint 150, so the next maintenance release. I have um, done several things, improvements, bug fixes, merged a couple of PRs. More on that later. There's one thing uh, that I want to talk about here because that was a very Mm, let's just let's just say spontaneous de decision to include it in 150 and which is probably going to confuse some people um, because I finally removed the possibility to disable access control and um, the reason for that is that sadly uh, there are still way too many cases uh, cases of people who uh, put their completely unsecured and um, unprotected octoprint and attached printer on the public internet because they seem to think that if they do not tell anyone their IP and their port number, they are protected and nothing can happen to them, which obviously and of course is completely wrong. Because the second that you put an IP or the, the, the second that you put any kind of device on the public internet, it will be scanned and it will be included in common search en engines like Shodan IO and people will be able to query what services you are running on, no matter on what ports you are running them on. So, yeah. Uh, I've been sounding like a broken record on that topic for the past couple of years and uh, sadly, yeah, people are still doing that, even though Octoprint tells them at a couple of places to not do that, please. And um, yeah, usually when when uh, servers like that are found online, uh, one of two things happen. Uh, Either I get an email from an uh, yeah from a more or less uh, worried security researcher that there is probably there, that there is a problem with my software because someone decided to put it online unsecured uh, contrary to any kind of recommendations, um, or the people that get their instances taken over by someone with a malicious intent and use their printers to do whatnot or uh, yeah just fire up the heaters to max or something like that, come on the forums or somewhere else and cry about how they got hacked when in fact they pretty much just left their car unlocked on a weird street with the keys in the ignition. So yeah, as I said, I've tried combating this through uh, education, through constant imploring, basically every chance that I get to not do stuff like this, to not put your Octoprint instance on the internet. And if so, to at least, at the very least, enable the, the access control that is included. But yeah, people don't listen. And um, frankly, I will no longer allow this inability to listen or to, uh, yeah, or, or, or this, this this trend towards personal convenience to cause me any additional work uh, and users and the, and the fact that users uh, the kind of grief that uh, an unsecured Octoprint instance on the public internet uh, causes them. So starting with 150, access control can no longer be disabled. 
it is now mandatory, which means that once you update to the first uh, release uh, uh, after 1.5.0 or, or the first release candidate of 1.5.0 and, and you have access control disabled so far, Octoprint will detect that, will ask you to please create a username and a password, and you will need to provide that going forward if you want to log into your Octoprint instance. Um, Existing options that have been in Octoprint for years now that uh, allow you, if you dig a bit into the configuration file, to um, uh, enable something called auto, -log uh, auto login local, uh, which automatically logs in one specific account if it, if if you are accessing the instance from a um, yeah from a from a well defined uh, a trusted network range are still enabled are still possible so what you can do is uh, you can make it so that if you are on your local area network in a completely trusted and secured environment you can still set up octoprint so that it will automatically lock you into this single uh, account that you've created or into another account that you've created or something like that but you will have to create account from a now, uh, an account from now on. And yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry that this is necessary. Uh, I really wish we could just leave a functionality like that into some in something that is meant to be run only on your local network and not be exposed on something as hostile as the public internet. But yeah, let's just say the experiment failed and now, uh, yeah, stuff needs to be done about it because I, 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 really, I really simply do not want to get an email about this every other week uh, or find horrible blog posts on security websites about this. So, um, yeah, it is like it is. We'll see how this works. Okay. Um, and also, since usually this question arises when I say something like this, uh, there are safe options to access your uh, Octoprint instances, instance from outside of your local area network. One is the ngrok plugin by Aldo, uh, aka Field of View. Uh, there are uh, things like, uh, uh, how was it called again? Octoprint Anywhere, I think, uh, the portal, uh, the, the po 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 there are several cloud plugins. I'm, I'm currently, my head is a bit mushy, so sorry. <laughs> I'm currently not able to remember all of them, but we also have this nice blog post online that tells you about all of these options and also tells you to maybe look into creating uh, creating a virtual private network. And uh, yeah, I can only recommend doing that instead of blindly port forwarding stuff. It, it really is a really bad idea, not only for Octoprint, for anything really that is running on your local network. So um, yeah, do not blindly port forward to anything that has that allows access to physical things that are located in your home. You don't want your fridge on the internet, you don't want your home assistant on the internet, and you don't want your printer on the internet either, or your paper printer for that matter, or your laser cutter for that matter. So please just don't do that. And as I said, I'm sounding like a broken record on that topic, and I will probably still continue to do that, but at least from now on, no, now on, I will hopefully no longer come across any unsecured instances on the internet, or at least none that are newer than uh, one, four, two. Yeah. Okay. Uh, on to something maybe a bit more positive. Um, also, Jim just noticed the Spaghetti, spaghetti detect Detective obviously also allows you to remotely access your instance. Never mind. Um, okay, so uh, positive stuff. PRs merged, as I mentioned. Um, first of all, thanks to Charlie Powell, uh, the guy who you probably all by now uh, have heard of because he's also the one who authored the uh, Python 3 migration script. Um, because he submitted, uh, first of all, a PR that pulls the, the font awesome version to five. So we now have way, way more icons to work with in the UI, which would also be of interest to many plugin authors out there. Um, and also he added EEPROM support for the virtual printer. So that will also hopefully help a lot of plugin authors out there. So thanks, thanks Charlie for that. And while we are talking about updated dependencies, I also got a PR to pull uh, the included knockout JS version from 3.4 to 3.5 by J7126. <laughs> so, <coughs> sorry, I don't know. How, I don't have um, a second, please. <coughs> Yay. 
Wonderful. Um, I don't have a full name to that, so you have to do with the nickname here. Um, and another thing that I changed after a somewhat, uh, hmm, let's just say, unfriendly issue on that topic, and uh, we have some more details on that later, but uh, still someone complained that uh, if Octoprint refuses to, uh, to send a command to the printer because, for example, you have told Octoprint the printer does only have one extruder, and now you're sending it a tool change command to extruder number three, um, that Octoprint just silently, not not really silently because it locks this, but yeah, it doesn't go out of its way to warn you about that, that this can easily be missed and uh, cause weird issues. For example, if you are running a tool changer set up with a wrong, wrong or, or yeah, an errors, an error, an error, an error, a wrong configured <laughs> uh, printer profile. Erroneously? I have no idea how to pronounce that word. I know how it's written, but I... Okay, regardless. Um, so in that case, the tool change command will not be sent, but you as a user will not know about that. And uh, that is unless you look into the log file, but okay, I get it. Um, so that is a bit suboptimal and I totally get this. So what will now happen is if Octoprint throws away a command that is supposed to be sent to the printer uh, by you, either because, uh, yeah, it's a tool change command that doesn't match uh, the configured amount of tools in your printer profile, or because your firmware recently during this connection session um, told you that, or told Octoprint that this that they doesn't know this tool and uh, yeah, it's an unknown tool, uh, then Octoprint will throw a little notification in your face and tell you, hey, uh, I was supposed to send this to the printer, but I couldn't because reason and uh, yeah, so just so you know. And the same will happen if uh, a, a tool is, uh, sorry, a command is enqueued to be sent to Octoprint that is not, um, yeah, that is blocked. Uh, so there's this block list in the in the serial uh, co configuration in the serial settings of Octoprint, which by default only contains, I think, M0 and M1, because those will, yeah, basically completely halt the printer unless you press a button. So instead, Octoprint just pauses the print on its side and continues to communicate to the printer and not send this by default. Uh, so if anything on this block list is supposed to be sent, but then blocked, uh, Octoprint will also send a notification about this. And um, yeah, I would strongly recommend all plugin authors that have similar fun functionality like blocking commands or something like that or swallowing up commands. Um, yeah, to, to utilize the new events that I implemented for that, which will automatically allow these notifications to also pop, pop up in any cases like this. So uh, that stuff is already documented. I think it's called something like suppressed command or command suppressed. I'm not entirely sure which way around, but it's in the docs uh, for the maintenance branch. And um, yeah, take a look at that if you, are plug if you are the author of a plugin that also blocks commands because I cannot necessarily detect whether this uh, whether this t happens because I mean maybe I could but uh, um, so I would rather leave this to the plugins to implement accordingly and so there's just a simple event that can be fired in such a case so that anyone interested in uh, reacting to that for example the core UI which fires out this notification will know yeah um, and that will hopefully uh, avoid any kind of confusion caused by this so far. For uh, like, for example, in uh, with the Prusa MMU uh, add-on, which uh, some people run with a wrong uh, printer profile, and then weird stuff happens uh, with tool change commands. So yeah. Um, I also fixed some bugs with the new software update features that I showed last time. I think where. Um, yeah, plugins can now also utilize the release channel functionality and you can also um, ignore certain update notifications right from the update list. And there was a bug uh, in in both of these functionalities. It was one bug with two symptoms basically and Jim and Charlie uh, both reported those and then we got them fixed. So thanks for the report. Um, and uh, what I also did was um, yeah, there have been some reports of um, printer stuttering or just in sluggish loading times when the file list is really, really big. 
So tons of files in there with tons of metadata. And uh, I have not been able to completely reproduce this. So not the stuttering, only the, well, the request takes long uh, thing. And um, what I spotted was that there were still some easy uh, optimizations or easy fixes to, to be gained with regards to, to caching on the file list. So um, I've now implemented some more aggressive caching on this endpoint, on this RP endpoint, in the hopes that it will hopefully reduce the occurrences of uh, the, the amount of occurrences like that. And yeah, as I mentioned, a lot more bug fixes and improvements. Uh, I really cannot go into all of them here right now. Uh, just take a look into the commit log maybe, or in the uh, release notes once I put them out for 3.5, uh, sorry, for 1.5.0 RC1. Um, but I think I can safely sum it up as September and October were primarily spent on 1.5.0, but not exclusively, because I also finally found the time again to work on uh, what is going to be Octoprint 2.0. And currently this primarily consists of code cleaning and uh, getting rid of uh, various Python 2 leftovers in there and Python 2, Python 3 compatibility workaround thingies like duplicated import statement, statements with uh, import error catch blocks and stuff like that. And I also got some uh, really nice help on that from Frank from the Homo System project, who uh, ha submitted some PRs to clean up, um, yeah, some some Python two specific futures imports and uh, and uh, Pragma headers and all that. And then I also spent a significant amount of time of cleaning up all these import these these special imports and also removing some workarounds and. Uh, changing some logic here and there where it no longer needed as complicated needed to be as complicated as it used to be and then i spent quite some time to create tooling um, to detect all that stuff that i had cleaned up using um, something called what is it called again lib cst right lib cst uh, which creates um yeah, an, a concrete syntax tree so that I can parse. I, I, it basically parses Python code for me and allows me to detect certain patterns in it and also rewrite it and rewrite the files directly. And that is really, really nice because now I have yeah, basically uh, a bunch of code mods, uh, which I also have published, published on, on GitHub under uh, uh, github.com slash octoprint slash code mods, uh, which uh, will do all of this cleanup stuff automatically. And where automatic cleanup in that regard is not the best idea because it requires a bit of looking at the code and, and uh, what was meant to be done there. I at least implemented some additional code checks that will detect certain patterns that are no longer needed. Like, for example, um, importing from pass.buildins, uh, which belongs to Python futures, uh, future, um, which is like this compatibility layer that we no longer need now with the devil branch and what is going to be 2.0 being Python 3 uh, exclusive. Um, so it will detect that and warn me during the regular um, CI uh, stuff, uh, CI tests and checks and, and all that. And that will hopefully really help to ensure that whenever in the coming months I will have to merge up from the maintenance branch and from the 1.x uh, code base uh, accordingly, I will not get, yeah, Python 2 specifics creeping back into the code base again after this cleanup run. Yeah. And um, another thing that I finally did that I've been meaning to for yeah several months now, and uh, which I kept mentioning here, um, you might not have seen it yet, but uh, yeah, it's, it's actually working really nicely, is uh, the plugin repository now allows you to star plugins right from the plugin detail page. So uh, you just can log into your GitHub account right from within the plugin repository now, or a little lock, uh, login link. And uh, on, on plugins that are hosted on GitHub, which the plugin repository detects uh, during the, the build step, um, it will now offer you to start the plugin right away from there. And uh, I would really like if many people use this uh, feature simply because it also gives the plugin authors uh, 
some sign of appreciation, right? Um, it's not just people actually install my plugin, which they already can see in the stats that are published on the pub plugin repository, but instead they also see that their repository on GitHub itself is being started. And that might also be interesting for them if they try to apply for certain um, open source project support perks or something like that. For example, uh, if you want to get a community license for PyCharm, uh, or rather an open source license for PyCharm Pro, then you need to show certain activity and all that. And uh, yeah, seeing that a project is really liked might also help in that regard. So please, if you see this next time you browse in the plugin repository, not from within Octoprint, mind you, but actually on plugins.octoprint.org, please, um, yeah, just log into your GitHub account and star your favorite plugins and give a bit back that way to the authors of these plugins. I think they will be very happy to see that. Um, and uh, also, as I mentioned, this is currently GitHub exclusive, so it only works for plugins that are running on uh, GitHub. The thing is, these are the majority uh, currently. There are some that are hosted on private um, uh, on private Git uh, uh, repositories, on, on GitLab, uh, for example, on GitLab instances, on, 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 on the GitLab instance itself, S things like that. And um, if I see this feature actually getting used, then I will also see uh, if there is demand for that, if, uh, if we can maybe at least um, yeah, Im implement it for uh, GitLab itself. The problem is that I will as far as I understand um, the API requirements and all that, probably not be able to implement it for privately owned GitLab instances. Uh, so that is a bit of a limitation there. Um, I consciously made the decision to not create my own persistence layer and uh, yeah, persist the, the, the thumbs up or the starring or whatever uh, in there, specifically for Octoprint, because I think that yeah, I, it just feels a bit wrong trying to create yet another platform to raid stuff on when most is hosted on one that allows this already. And uh, it would also, yeah, um, make this more visible to the general community. So that is the idea right now. I just hope it works out the way that I am hoping or that I planned it to. Yeah. Um, and another thing that happened fairly recently during, uh, yeah, since the last time is Octobrin now has an, has adopted a code of conduct. Um, and uh, that one applies to all official communication challenge, uh, channels. So uh, the issue tracker, the, uh, the forums, the Discord channel, the IRC channel, uh, in my opinion, also the YouTube comments, but um, yeah, I guess that will be tough to enforce uh, possibly. Uh, in any case, um, yeah, there is now a code of conduct. And the question of course is why now? And uh, yeah, the sad answer to that is that simply the number of instances of completely inappropriate behavior has increased tremendously over the past couple of months. And uh, like two weeks or something ago, saw, saw a peak where three conse consecutive days I saw myself facing behavior that I do not want to quote here, but which was simply on a level where I do not, yeah, where I, 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 I will not stand for that kind of stuff happening in the Octoprint op uh, community and uh, neither targeting me nor targeting, targeting anyone else for that matter. So, um, yeah. That made me think, okay, uh, it might actually be time to make a formal declaration of what kind of community we all, I guess, at least, we all want Octoprint's community to be and what kind we don't want it to be. And thus I sat down and read a, comp uh, a bunch of um, pre-made code of conducts and finally decided on simply adopting the uh, covenant, uh, contributor covenant, I think it's called, uh, um, COC, because reading through that, I realized, okay, that is pretty much what we already do anyhow. So yeah, let's just use that. And um, yeah, uh, what I think this means is that there will probably for, for most of you seeing this now and interacting and, 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 and communicating in the, in, in the various, uh, 
Octoprint community outlets, uh, there will probably be no noticeable change for any of you because the majority of you are awesome, are, uh, are um, welcoming, are um, lovely, uh, <laughs> just to say it that way. Um, so uh, yeah, for those of you who, who are simply nice, friendly people who simply are trying to fix their problems or, 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 or help others with their problems, there will not be, will not be any kind of change by this code of conduct. However, it will give all of us something to point people to who are, yeah, not really uh, trying to make an effort to behave well. Let's say, let's say it like that. Um, so we have a formal set of rules that we can refer people to. We have a set of measures defined in that in those rules that make clear what will happen and what is okay, and what kind of mitigations are uh, to be taken if someone consciously breaks these rules. And yeah, that is pretty much the whole goal. I do not expect this uh, will mean that I will never again run into some entitled jerk, uh, but. Uh, at least now it gives me and all of you actually a set of rules to clarify what behaving like a jerk actually means and also a better way to remove people like that from the community before they yeah poison the atmosphere so to speak and i seriously would have preferred if this step wasn't needed and if we could just all be as awesome as we have been in this community for the past years without having to formalize what kind of behavior we do not tolerate, but similar to the thing with the access control, the experiment failed and uh, yeah, it sadly is needed apparently. So yeah, please read the code of conduct. You can find it linked uh, in the discord rules in the uh, footer of the Octoprint community forums and also on the website on octoprint.org itself. So. Uh, it should be fairly easy to, to find it. And I think it was octoprint.org slash conduct, I think. Yeah. So what else happened? Uh, oh, oh dear, we're already half an hour in and I'm, all, I'm still recounting what happened. It happened a lot. Um, I was at the virtual East Coast Rap Rap Festival, gave a short talk there as well at the start of October, I think that was <clears throat> first or second weekend, something like this. Um, gave a short talk about some of the new features coming in 1.5.0. It was only seven minutes, but it was a lot of fun still. And uh, had some nice virtual chats with some of you uh, as well on the on the uh, conference Discord. That was nice. And I also recorded or, or was was a guest on the on the Meltzone podcast episode 39 with uh, with Tom and Stefan. And uh, yeah, we spent like one and a half hours talking about uh, CAT and uh, open source maintenance in general, and also weirdly enough, mental health and uh, how to not go crazy when you do what we do. Um, if you haven't given that a listen yet, I, yeah, I can just tell you to be sure to check it out. Um, uh, I had a lot of ton uh, I have to say I had a ton of fun doing that and uh, yeah I would love to do it again at some point but yeah we'll see and I also am very honored to report now that I am a part of the github star program which uh, is uh, a new program that they launched a couple of mm, two or three months ago I think uh, for um, yeah prominent open source maintainers um, and uh, it basically means now that I get a bit of a foot into the door at GitHub so that I can also, yeah, try to um, give feedback on, on uh, future platform features and all that and also get my voice and the voice of the open source community as a whole heard uh, with regards to the direction that some things, some things are going. So that is really nice. And it also is a really, really great um, kind of... Um, feedback and yeah I, I I was very very happy to hear that uh, that I made it so to speak so ooh. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so that was all that I had prepared that I did. I probably did even more than that. I honestly, it's just a blur the past couple of weeks and I'm still struggling to understand how we can already be almost in November because it feels like we are still somewhere in July. I have no idea what is going on in this year. Um, what are the next steps? So uh, I really want to see that I get a 150 out of the door or at the very least a, re a first release candidate. Because, yeah, I, there's still some minor stuff that I wanted to take a look at. And I also got at least one or maybe two new bug reports today that, or the, yesterday, I don't know, um, that I need to take a closer look at. But other than that, it it, it, it is in fairly great shape. And, uh, yeah, so it, it's time to, to work on getting it out uh, to the release candidate testing folks. Um, and the final goal, obviously, is to to get it out before Christmas still. So uh, that means I need to get it out <laughs> because usually our uh, our release candidate phase these days takes like a month, uh, sometimes even a bit more than that. And uh, I try to not push out any releases after December 10th or 12th or something so that there is always still a bit of time until I go into my Christmas vacation time or a time out. Um, in case there are any issues, consider it a frozen zone, uh, basically, that I try to get anything done before. Yeah. Um, apart from that, I obviously also want to continue to work on 2.0.0. Now that I've uh, finally done this first code cleanup uh, work. And the next thing that I will have to do is do all of that again on the Comri right branch. Uh, because so first merge what is currently in devil onto that resolve all the millions of uh, merge uh, conflicts that will probably result out of that uh, cry silently and <laughs> and uh, try to not go crazy when I do that and uh, then uh, get rid of all the Python 2 stuff in that as well. And yeah, I, I got to admit that I'm kind of dreading, dreading all of this, but it needs to be done. And uh, yeah, I hope that this not the merge conflict resolution, but at least the cleanup stuff will be accelerated by all the tooling that I wrote uh, that I mentioned earlier, the code mods and all that, because obviously I can just throw that against this code as well. And um, another thing that will happen uh, maybe after the next installment of these, but I'm still going to mention it now, um, I'll be taking part in the virtual GitHub Universe conference uh, this year and uh, be part of a panel session on managing burnout and sustainability in open source on December 10th, uh, together with even you from um, from Vue.js and uh, Wes McKinney, uh, who is uh, is behind the Pandas project, the Python Pandas project. And I got to say, I'm beyond excited for this opportunity. And I was like, Woo! when I got the invite for that, um, I cannot give you more details yet on, on what, what we will be precisely talking about apart from the title, because I, uh, yeah, we still have to talk about some stuff there, but, um, yeah, it's already public on the schedule, uh, as I said, December 10th and, um, be sure to tune in and uh, check out the conference schedule in general. There's, they are still filling it up, but there are already a bunch of really exciting talks in there that I will also see that I can catch. Um, and uh, as far as I know, the attendance is free, so make sure to click that. Um, and <laughs> yeah, and Wiesel just mentioned something. Uh, something that I will also have to take care of. Uh, first of all, so we probably will try to look into Guy Schaeffer, who maintains the Octopi project and me are currently trying to coordinate when we will release a first release candidate of Octopi 018, because this has become a somewhat more pressing matter now, as we uh, currently are seeing an increase of, um, of uh, reports on the community forums that apparently some Raspberry Pi 4s now ship with a different bootloader or whatnot. I have no idea. We are still trying to figure out what exactly is the change, but that change makes it so that just because it says Raspberry Pi 4 2 gigabyte, it no longer means necessarily that Octopi 0.17.0 will boot on that. And you might have to use one of the 0.18 nightlies, 
we are aware of the situation we're trying to figure out the situation and as i said we are also trying to um get a uh, get uh, 018 released as a consequence of that even though that will probably mean that it will ship still with octoprint 142 and not Oct octoprint 150 but i think that is yeah something that people will hopefully survive um yeah so hooray uh, <laughs> i love it when 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 i'm forced to uh, suddenly play play a fire woman uh, in in such a situation but okay uh we'll see that we somehow get this managed in a, as a community uh, and in general what i also what what my next steps in general are as well is uh yeah i i really need to look more into keeping all of this sustainable because i noticed that uh, the past couple of weeks months this whole year has been ridiculously intense and i'm noticing that i yeah I, I'm constantly tired again, and I really do not want this to become a thing. Um, so, yeah, in general, what I'm what I'm trying to say here is, when I tell you about stuff that I plan to do next, um, this is obviously stuff that I want to do next. But uh, with everything constantly coming in from the side, like the Raspberry Pi situation right now, uh, or any kind of bugs or any kind of support scenarios or stuff like that. Um, my primary goal is in general and always has been to keep all of this work sustainable. So if stuff takes longer than expected, then yeah, that is the reason. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm currently kind of expecting uh, another one of these crazy crunch time situations like I had during the first lockdown, lockdown uh, in uh, April and May because yeah starting monday we'll have the whole no whole, whole november in in germany has been declared a lockdown light and probably a lot of people will be working from home and having have time for their printers again and contrary to last time that will not mean that i try to work 10 hours a day and during the weekends as well so yeah <laughs> please wish me luck that um it doesn't become that bad as it did the first time around and uh, yeah as I said, keep in mind that if things take longer than you'd like them to, rest assured, uh, I would probably prefer things to go faster as well. Um, I would certainly prefer to be able to develop at the same pace that I back did back in 2015, for example. But back then, the user base was way smaller. The amount of overhead that I had due to maintenance, due to support requests and all that was way smaller. And it was simply a different time with the same number of resources so yeah just wanted to say that now i promised you a quick look at the stats and there is actually not that much to see but uh yeah still where's the button to switch you over <laughs> um right so these are the stats for the past seven days uh this yeah it's it's pretty much all of that is pretty much business as usual i gotta say um we have a healthy amount of of version mix here honestly though i have to say those 900 people here still running 1310 please update um and 1311 as well i mean seriously those versions are now way over a year old um healthy um printing patterns as well and especially of interest of uh, of course right now our python 3 percentage is increasing which is really really nice so unless i'm uh, mistaken we are now looking at something like hmm, eight seven eight percent why do i not have percentages enabled for that uh, i'll do that later but yeah as you see this was the time when the when the uh, this is actually 60 days not seven as written up here um and this here was when the update script was released so yeah it's increasing and this is a logarithmic scale do not forget that um people are still printing like mad about 100 years uh, of printing time accumulated in one week and since i always find it funny to see how this number is exploding recently the past 60 days saw 111,803 instances all in all and yeah as i mentioned a bunch of times based on the stats that i see whenever i push out a an octoprint release uh, 
the 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 um the amount of additional traffic this causes on the Pi Wheels project combined uh, or compared to my own stats shows that the actual instance number is probably eight to ten times this much. So Jesus, um, yeah, okay, cool. Um. Another thing that I wanted to tell you about these stats uh, is that um, that we also now have this, which might be of interest to some of you if you w want to run your own uh, extraction on, on the statistics, because we have a JSON dump of 7-day and 30-day instance stats here, the same for plugin stats, and fairly new still also for the Python stats. So. Um, if we take a look in here, you can see uh, this this JSON format, which here tells you the count of uh, how many individual instances and how they spread across all the versions that were reported, and also in histogram. And similarly, the same for the plugins uh, listed by plugin, uh, number of instances, versions, how often they were installed and uninstalled, and all that. And for the Python stats. Uh, it's uh, yeah version uh, uh, instance count per version, and also a histogram with Python two versus Python three. So uh, I'm running these exports against the. Let me quickly switch back to myself. Uh, I'm running these uh, exports against the the tracking database. So all the data that you saw just on the graphs, this is the same stuff that lands in these exports. And I, those are public. So if you want to use this data, uh, it's completely anonymized. There is no way to find anything out about individual instances with that. So be my guest, run stuff on that. Just please don't run my traffic bill up that high by querying this every 10 seconds because it's only being refreshed every uh, hour or so. I'm not entirely sure right now, actually. Um, 1601, 17, yeah, okay, that that should be UTC and thus every hour. Yeah. Um, and uh, I also plan to add more exports there, um, but I simply have not yet had, had a chance to do that. But just so you know, the data is there. If you want to play around with it, do it. And if you want other stuff, if you want more data there, have specific interests, maybe just get in touch on the Discord server or in the forums and I will see what, what I can do. Uh, because, yeah, exporting this via a cron job is fairly easy for me. And uh, this is, by the way, the plugin stats data is, by the way, also what we now use to enrich the plugin repository itself. So the let me quickly maybe show you this. And uh, I have to switch you back again. Um, so these these top ten of the month trending this week, and also if you click on one of the plugins here and look at uh, the the active instances, the past month, new installs, the past week, this all this data is being uh, populated from this export. And speaking of which, this by the way here is the starring feature that I mentioned because uh, here is. If I hadn't already logged into this, there would now be a login button here. And this shows that I start the bad level visualizer plugin. Uh, if I remove this now, you will see the stars count also decreases again. And I can also obviously edit back. So yeah, just use this, please. Make make people like Jim happy. Um, yeah, back to me. Hooray. OK. That was that, which now brings us actually to the Q&A segment, I think. So, uh, and apologies if you're hearing the church bells in the background again. They are going a bit nuts ever since the pandemic started. Okay, so. Octoprenner 35 Q&A. Question by Roms. Um, if you were doing a rewrite of Octoprint, what would you do differently or improve? Which design decisions did you make that you would make differently today? For example, would you develop the GUI and core separately? Would you do a complete rewrite or try to reuse large parts of the existing code base? Okay, so that is a long question. Uh, <laughs> and I'm trying to do my best here uh, to answer it. Um, first of all, the most important part, I would do so much stuff differently. 
Um, I know so much more now about how Python works internally, uh, what works and doesn't work so well with Python, uh, things about about JavaScript that I didn't know back then, about uh, co about printer communication didn't, that I didn't know back then. So a pretty, I, I think if I would start today, would working on Octoprint today with the knowledge that I have today, it would probably look very differently, uh, architecturally, I mean. Um, that being said, so first of all, what I would do and I would have, what I also still hope to be able to do long term, uh, though I have to experiment with it first and see what kind of impact it has on the plugin capabilities, is to separate the server parts, so the parts that yeah serve the HTTP, a the API, the web uh, interface and all that from the com layer parts. So anything that communicates with the print itself, because uh, yeah, right now I I mentioned this in the past, I think on this, uh, in this, in this, uh, yeah, in Octoprint on air, I'm constantly running against the limitations of uh, what is called the global interpreter lock in Python, which effectively prevents, prevents me from utilizing multiple processors, uh, multiple processor cores from, from within Python easily and without forking out into C code and all that. So um, yeah, uh, that is something that I would do um, and something that I simply wasn't aware of back when I started working on Octoprint. I originally came from the Java world where uh, being able to spread across multiple processes, uh, multiple, multiple cores is like just you, you create a new thread and that's it. And uh, I was kind of shocked when I had to learn that this wasn't the case with Python and uh, or rather with CPython, I should say, which is like the most common uh, reference implement uh, or the, the reference implementation of Python because there is also um, PyPy, uh, P-Y-P-Y, uh, uh, spelled, and um, Iron Python and stuff like that. But the, the most prominent version of Python that um, people usually mean when they say Python is, uh, is the C Python implementation. And this, the, this most prominent version has the, has the GIL, the global inter interpreter lock, and that is making my life so difficult. Um, but as I said, uh, the idea to separate out the, the the communication into its the communication layer into its own process is still something that is that is swirling around in my head and I want to experiment with. Uh, so maybe that will still become the reality in uh, in a future version. Uh, the downside of this is that having it in a separate process that requires inter-process communication means that stuff like uh yeah for example octolabs or uh any kind of firmware workaround plugins get yeah get made their life a bit more difficult um but yeah we'll have to see if this is a death that we want to die or not um also in general i would probably keep the ui as a whole separate uh in a, in a separate project maybe even on a different release cycle um, simply in order to reduce the coupling uh, that I'm currently I currently have still in the code here and there, uh, I've gotten rid of, rid of that in yeah over the years, but uh, not entirely. So extracting that into its own bundled but separately maintained plugin might actually improve in general the the. Yeah, the code quality per se, as in reduced coupling. So coupling is when parts of your code require on uh, parts of your code depend on other parts of your code that are not directly. Um, how, how do I say that? Imagine you have various components in your code or, or in your in your application. And if you now change something on one side, ideally, the idea would be that only this component is affected. But if you have coupled components, if you have tightly coupled components, then it can happen that if you change something there, something here changes as well. And yeah, this is something that you can avoid more easily if you write really modular code, like for example, you force yourself to use plugins, which is also by the way, why new stuff that I implement in Octoprint, like the Pi support plugin, or also the firmware check on the file check and all that are all plugins because it forces me to decouple them from the core of Octoprint. And that makes maintenance so much easier. Um, but yeah, that's that's something that I would probably apply to the core UI as well. 
Uh, what I would not change, even though I still curse a lot about the gill, is um, I would still use Python. Uh, this is a choice that I do not regret making, even though it has cost me a bunch of gray hair, um, simply because uh, it has sped up development for me tremendously. And yeah, looking at first time plugin developers, I have the impression that I might be mistaken with that, but I have the impression that they struggle way, way more with the front end with the JavaScript stuff than they do with the back end Python stuff because it's fairly straightforward. Uh, it takes a very minimal amount of lines in order to achieve quite a lot of very helpful stuff. So, for example, work around firmware quirks. Um, and uh, yeah, so it feels like this language is not not only suited for for me personally, but it also apparently is entry friendly enough that it allows people who never so far wrote uh, wrote a lot of code and certainly not an Octoprint plugin to to easily get started. Yeah. And uh, what I would not do is rewrite it completely from scratch because. Frankly, I think, I mean, it would make a lot of stuff easier to just say I do a full bone rewrite and just completely clean slate, uh, green meadow. I can just do all the things that I think would be a good idea today and not care at all about anything that was. But the problem with this obviously is that I completely nuke the whole ecosystem that has now sprouted up around Octoprint. So all the plugins possibly also all the third party API clients and all of that. And that would be a real shame because I think that is one of the major selling points of Octoprint. This is not Octoprint itself, but rather the ecosystem that it allowed to flourish and making or, or cre rewriting something and making it compatible to that. I think that would be more work than just ripping out parts and replacing them. So not a full rewrite. So yeah. I hope that roughly answers this question because I still have two more to cover. <laughs> um, uh, the next question by André, um, I'm, I, I translated that because he, he asked it in German. Uh, I'm running touch UI. Oh, wait, uh, I'm running touch UI on an embedded seven inch display, but that seems more tailored towards tablets or phones. Will you build in, in a UI similar to Octodash or does that maybe exist as a plugin? Um, so I don't have anything like this planned right now. And uh, I think that will also not change in the very near or in the, in the far, far away future. Um, as you already pointed out, uh, with Octodash and there's also Octoscreen and OctoBTT and uh, probably a bunch of other stuff that I don't have, uh, uh, at the top of my head right now, there are several standalone solutions that provide you with an, uh, with an, with a UI that is, um, yeah, tailored towards being run on an embedded interface of various sizes. And, um, personally, I, yeah, I don't think that it would be a, a good use of my time personally to write another one, uh, a competing one, even if it was built right into Octoprint. Octoprint does have uh, the uh, so-called UI pl plugin mix-in that allows to fully replace the interface also based on request parameters. So you could do something like, I don't know, detect that it comes from a certain browser or from a certain user agent or from localhost or something at request and then serve that UI instead of the regular one. And um, so, so something like this could totally be done as a plugin. Uh, but so far, as far as I know, no one has done it. I don't know why it would be interesting. Maybe, uh, in general for embedded displays though, I'd really recommend rather a na native application, uh, instead of firing up a whole browser, um, Firefox as well as Chromium are a bit on heavy side. So I don't know, maybe you do not want to have the print, uh, the, the pie that is currently busy streaming a print job to your printer, also trying to parse JavaScript and execute JavaScript and whatnot. So just my thoughts. Personally, I would rather go for a native application instead of a plugin, but this is my personal opinion. Um, also, what I would like to add here is, uh, as I mentioned a bunch of times, I'm currently also 
trying to wrap my head around a possible new user interface for Octoprint based on more modern uh, frameworks, either Vue.js or React.js. I still have not made a decision because I still haven't made, uh, been able to complete my coursework on that. Um, and that will certainly be more mobile compatible than the current one. I'm consciously not saying mobile first because personally, I, in my opinion or in my experience, mobile first oftentimes also means desktop second. And that is how these UIs then look and feel. And this is not optimal either. Um, so yeah, that just as, as, as a, as a, as a quick, uh, for your interest here. Um, uh, but in any case, as a too long, didn't read or too long, didn't watch rather on, on this whole thing, on this whole question is, um, is, uh, personally, I do not plan to do something like that. Uh, if anyone wants to give it a shot and has questions and all that, please come on the discord or on the community forum. There are a bunch of people that are very, very helpful, myself included, when I find the time to, to get new or less experienced plugin developers up to speed. And uh, it would be really nice in general, I got to say, to see some UI plugins here and there from the community, because so far I, I edit this, I think in Octoprint 130, this plugin type, and so far I only have companies see actually use it. Uh, so Mr. Beam used it for their, for their interface and, uh, yeah, uh, Leapfrog, I think also did, did a bit of a total conversion and, and, and one, one commercial industrial metal printer thing also, I think used that. No, they, they actually went, went with something else, one click metal and yeah. So it would really be nice to see this used by a plugin co coming from the community and not just by stuff from companies, but and uh, Franzi just uh, threw into the chat that uh, if you need a minimalist browser, look for Datenstrahler on GitHub by Vain, uh, V-A-I-N, uh, can recommend, written by a colleague of me. Uh, thank you for the, for the hint. That sounds promising. Okay, so uh, the last question for, uh, by, <laughs> by Aldo. Uh, without meaning to trigger your PTSD, how's the com layer coming along? What have been the main stumbling blocks apart from the Python 3 situation taking over your attention? I wouldn't call it PTSD, but I got to say that this whole thing is actually giving me nightmares by now. Um, because every time that I want to concentrate it, something gets into the way. So I started working on it back in 2015. And the first thing that completely brought development to a screeching halt back then was that I realized that I had made some wrong, wrong assumptions about how firmware works, or rather there were some specific bugs in firmware that made some core concept that I had depended on completely, yeah, crash and burn. And so I had to throw everything away and start again. Then in 2016, when I finally found the time to concentrate again, the funding crisis hit and I had like somewhat different priorities first to save the project and yeah, make it someone somehow possible for me to continue working on it full time and not work on a new com layer. Then in 2017, I think I could actually focus on it somewhat because that is when the majority of what is now in the branch happened. Then there was just when I, when I wanted to look into this, there was a very disruptive personal situation in 2018. Then in 2019, the Python 3 uh, migration became somewhat pressing. And then in 2020, I mean, I do not have to tell you about the pandemic that is currently raging out there, right? So the whole year has just been a blur. And frankly, as I said, I, I really struggle to understand how, it's, how it can be almost November already. October was like over in a second. I have no idea where all the time went. But apparently going through what I have been up to the past couple of weeks earlier in this uh, broadcast at least showed me, okay, apparently I did get stuff done, even though it doesn't feel like it. Um, so the thing is with this com layer, I need to be able to fully concentrate on it exclusively for a while because writing something like this from scratch is not, um, not something that you just do next to maintenance or next to support or stuff like this. So yeah. I cannot do this really on the side. I need to concentrate on it for a couple of weeks. And uh, I really hope that I will be able to get back to it. 
this year still, but I hope I, I have not jinxed it now. Um, in general, overall, the biggest holdups, uh, apart from what I already mentioned, have been yeah, having to rewrite, in general, having to rewrite huge parts of it due to realizing uh, assumptions about firmware behavior were wrong about or, or having to work around specific quirks in firmware that were newly discovered. So what happened a bunch of times now is that I I got it to some point and I had to concentrate on maintenance and um, stuff like that for now, uh, for a while. And uh, then I learned something about some newly released printer that required some things to be added to that thing and that then made everything take longer in order to be able to work around it and all that. And you are asking just now in the chat if it needs to be from scratch. Yes. The architecture of the current one is something that has grown organically over the past eight years now, almost eight years now. And it's a bloody mess. Uh, it works. I I know why why it works <laughs> and i do find my way around in there but every time that i have to touch it it is just ugh, it's way too tightly coupled it is uh it is basically just one giant god class that knows of all the firmware quirk, quirks of possible firmware var var variants out there and uh has this huge amount of configuration inputs that allow it to react differently depending on what it faces and also detect stuff and all that and this is just oh it's horrible uh frankly every time that i have to go in there i i get this twitch in my eye and uh yeah i no this needs a more modular approach and this is i mean the current state of this rewrite is that it is almost done it it prints it works the only problem is that i now have to merge it again with the, the the devil stuff and that I have to merge all the workarounds into it basically that I did to the old one ever since I last had a chance to actually concentrate on it and this is usually biggest holdups that I'm facing so I work on it some then something happens I have to react and I have to leave it for a while uh, then I I add workarounds bug fixes stuff to the old one that I then have to migrate back and yeah, this has repeated several times now, and this is, yeah, ah, not so fun. Uh, yeah, in general, I think it would probably be much easier if I would just say, okay, it's only compatible to Marlin and everyone else is, uh, yeah, out of luck, but this is not how I roll, so, um, and this would also leave a lot of people in the rain, so I'm obviously not going to do that, but I have to say it would make things so much easier. Yeah. Uh, what I'm probably going to do, though, and uh, which I can now, considering that uh, it will not be part of the 1.x uh, release anymore, is uh, or releases anymore, is that I will simply not implement some things that are in the old one that, as far as I know, no one knows about or uses. Like, for example, pause triggers. I don't think anyone but me even knows these exist, even though they are documented in the configuration, but uh, that is stuff that just leaving it out will probably save me like three days of debugging and code writing so off it goes um and things like that uh so uh all in all yeah that thing is not giving me nightmares without reason but the last time i looked at it and i had a chance to work on it it looked fairly well uh, it was printing nicely it also seemed to perform better which is also a huge plus and it is way more modular, so yeah, reacting to certain printer quirks or such will be way, way easier. Also through plugins, by the way, so that is nice. Um, yeah, the only thing that is currently just really worrying me is having to merge. So yeah, this is not going to be fun, but it has to be done. So and, a po and I'm a poet and don't know it. Look at that. Yeah. Okay, so you might be able to hear it. The bells are ringing again. Uh, did I mention that they are going kind of crazy ever since this pandemic started? They are probably going to go on a five minute dower, uh, a dower, <laughs> on a five minute constant ringing uh, a spree at nine, uh, at, at uh, seven thirty, like every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And at least now they only do it on on Fridays, so, uh, Saturdays, and uh, Sundays. Uh, Friday, no, Thursday, Friday, and Saturdays. Yeah, the from from March until 
for three months. So, so early June or something like that, they did it every day. Every day, yeah. Every day at 18, at 6, and then again at 7.30 for five minutes straight. At a, at a volume that made it pretty much impossible to leave the windows open and still be able to listen to something here or talk with someone. It was a bit insane, but yeah. It was the first time I actually wrote a, wrote an email to a, a church, but okay. Um, anyhow, it's, uh, yeah, we are already a bit over time and it's getting a bit hot in here with the lights and all that. And also, by the way, new camera. I hope, uh, I hope it worked well. <laughs> uh, I've, I've upgraded my gear because I was not too happy anymore with the with the one I had, so I now upgraded to, and I'm not sponsored, obviously, uh, and I now upgraded to um, to a, Log a Logitech Streamcam from a Logitech uh, C920 that I had ever since 2016, 15, I don't know. So yeah, that is working nicely and uh, a bit more uh, darkness compatible, so to speak. So yeah, okay, uh, just wanted to say that quite happy with the purchase and uh, yeah so uh, the next regular one of these will probably be either at the end of November or maybe early December and I think that will probably also be the last one of this year uh, as always I will post the appointment on patreon and with that being said I'm quickly going to throw a glance over into the live chat Hmm. Yanda says, if the com layer attracts bad luck, rename it, e.g. to shout at printer layer. I mean, in a way, it already is a shout at printer layer, right? <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's also a curse at printer layer. Yeah. Okay, so I think we do not have any questions in the, in the, in the, in the chat. And also, as I said, we are a bit over time already anyhow. So I'm simply going to say thanks for being here. I hope it was interesting and uh, until next time, please stay healthy, wear a mask, wash your hands, all that stuff and uh, happy printing. Bye.